On this episode of Doing the Most, we're going to be making the tasty mead from the video game Valheim. Homemade brews and various artists, everything from mead to roast. Bake creation, fermentation, and heat creation, doing the most. Developed by a five-person team at Iron Gate Studio and released by Coffee Stain, it has quickly become one of the most played games on Steam, topping five million copies sold. And it only came out last month. While the world around Valheim is relatively complex, the premise of the game is actually fairly simple. Players play as Vikings in an afterlife, and there's a whole crafting and building element that has really caught fire in the Valheim community. If you browse any of the Valheim forums out there, like the Valheim subreddit, you will see incredible structures people are building, including meteries, and that's because you can make mead in the game. Now, unlike the game, to make mead in real life, you don't necessarily need a cauldron, but you will need a fermenter. One of our subscribers reached out shortly after the game was launched into early access and said, you should make a mead from this game. It includes mead recipes. And so we landed on the tasty mead because it seemed to be the easiest to construct a recipe around. And it's got some fairly accessible ingredients, unlike some of the other mead recipes in the game. So the tasty mead in and of itself is fairly simple. It's 10 honey, 10 raspberry, five blueberry. So in converting it for the homebrew scale, we went with one pound of honey, one pound of raspberries, and a half a pound of blueberries. In the game, it takes only two days to ferment, and it lowers your health regeneration by 50%, but raises your stamina regeneration by 300%. I hope ours can raise our stamina by 300%. The recipe for our tasty mead is fairly simple. Again, it's one pound of honey, one pound of raspberries, and a half a pound of blueberries. We're using a red wine yeast to help extract some of the colors from those fruit skins. Most of our bottles are gonna get sweetened with erythritol, a tablespoon per bottle. And we're also going to be bottle conditioning our bottles, which means we'll be using dextrose to prime the bottles so the yeast can create carbon dioxide and give us a fizzy drink. I'm not going to get into all the details of how to homebrew, but I will recommend we've got a playlist of videos called So You Want to Brew, and it covers a ton of topics about how to brew alcoholic beverages at home. But most importantly for this, I want to mention sanitation. You want to make sure that everything that touches your brew is sanitized. That means we're keeping all the microbes that could spoil our brew out and only keeping in the microbes that we put in there. Sanitizing at home is simple. I like to use Starzan. It's a phosphoric acid based sanitizer that you dilute with water and it's no rinse. So any of your gear that you sanitize, you just shake the excess off and you're ready to go. I started by freezing our fruit to help break down the cell walls a little bit. Quite often it's recommended if you're brewing with fruit to freeze and then thaw your fruit. What happens is the fruit juice inside forms ice crystals, and those ice crystals burst through the cell walls inside that fruit. This helps break down the fruit and release the juices, making it easier to ferment. And we're using gallberry honey here from Honey Next Door. It is a delicious and fruity honey, but you could use clover or wildflower. This is a two pound container, so I'm going to weigh out one pound of honey right into our sanitized two gallon bucket. We're brewing this in a two gallon bucket, so we have plenty of room for the fruit to rise up as the brew expands a little bit with the carbon dioxide that the yeast generate. Then our frozen and thawed fruit goes in, and we top that up to the one gallon mark with water. As our berries break down, they will release their juices, and we should have about one gallon total of liquid in here when primary fermentation is complete. Then we sanitize our mash paddle and give it a good stir, stir, stir to make sure the honey is completely incorporated into the liquid. The gear we're brewing with here comes with Homebrew Ohio's beginner mead making kit, which we actually feel is a really great introductory kit for beginner mead makers. It comes with brewing vessels, an auto siphon, hydrometer, and a lot of other bells and whistles. And of course, if you'd like to support the channel with your purchase, there is a link to that product in the description of this video. Here I'm using a hydrometer to measure the density of the liquid. This gives us a rough 
but fairly reliable estimate on what the potential alcohol by volume will be of the finished mead. So we pipe some of the unfermented mead, or must, into this graduated cylinder and take a reading. Here that reading was 1.040. The most basic way to explain alcoholic fermentation is that your yeast, little tiny microbes that are inside your brew, eat the sugars and convert them into both alcohols and CO2. These sugar sources can come from honey, like in mead, or from fruit, like in wines or in fruited meads. And I chose Red Star's Premier Rouge Red Wine Yeast for this. It's a good yeast for helping extract some of the color from those fruit skins, so we get a nice rich red mead on the other end of this. And I'm just pitching our yeast in dry here. Sometimes you'll see folks rehydrate their yeast. I'll do that on occasion, depending on what kind of yeast or what it is I'm brewing. But for this purpose, sprinkling it on top should work just fine. Also adding some Fermaid O. This is a nutrient for our yeast. That looks familiar. Oh no! In mead making, the topic of nutrition is incredibly important. Your yeast need a balanced diet in order to do good work making alcohol for you. If you don't feed your yeast good nutrition, they might crap out on you early, or they might create off flavors that you then have to wait to age out. In this, we used Fermato because I have tons of it on hand, but you could also get some diammonium phosphate from your local homebrew store, which is just a little powdered version of inorganic nitrogen that you can feed your yeast. For a brew like this that's fairly low in alcohol, diammonium phosphate works great. Now, you could skip giving your yeast the nutrient in this particular brew. It just may take a little bit longer for it to be drinkable than this one that we turned around to be drinkable in just a month's time. And then we're placing that under an airlock. Here we're using a bubbler airlock filled with sanitizing solution. That liquid acts as a valve. It keeps the unwanted microbes from being able to get in there while still allowing the CO2 gas to escape. And just a few short days later, that's finished fermenting. And as you can see from this hydrometer reading, it is at 1.000, which means all the fermentable sugars have fermented out. Now it's time to transfer it. We're transferring using a racking system. Racking involves siphoning from one vessel to the other using gravity. Here we're using an auto siphon, which creates a small vacuum that helps pull the liquid down and get our siphon started. And look at that color, beautiful. Then we're going to put that in our refrigerator for a few days so that it can cold crash. Getting it nice and cold like this causes most of the yeast to go into hibernation and helps them fall out of suspension, thus helping clear your brew. Once it has finished cold crashing, you'll see a nice thick cake of yeast at the bottom of your vessel. We're going to bottle condition this, meaning we're going to add a little bit of fermentable sugar to the bottles. The yeast will eat that and turn it into carbon dioxide. That way we get a nice fizzy drink. And then I'm using a racking system complete with a valved bottling wand to bottle these bottles from the bottom up. The reason we're using a racking system and a bottling wand to bottle our bottles is because we want to fill them from the bottom up and minimize oxygen exposure. When oxygen gets mixed into a finished brew, it can oxidize it, which leaves it with some nasty flavors, like cardboardy flavors. These are the off flavors that you might get if you try and say, funnel your brew into the bottles instead of using a bottling wand or a siphon. When I first started out brewing many, many years ago, I didn't use a bottling wand. I just used a length of tube and I would pinch it off as the bottle got full and move it to the next bottle and release. And it worked just fine. If that's the gear you're working with, you'll be okay. And then I decided I wanted most of these bottles sweet. In order to sweeten them, we need to use a non-fermentable sweetener. And this one is called erythritol. And it's very similar in flavor to sugar. However, the yeast can't eat it. So the yeast will eat those carbonation drops, which are just little tablets of pre-measured dextrose, but it won't eat the erythritol, meaning we can safely get a bottle conditioned drink that is sweet. If you were to sweeten this with a fermentable sugar, it would create way too much CO2 for the bottle to handle and the bottle would explode. This is called a bottle bomb and it can be very dangerous. I'm using a capper here to cap these bottles. Now you could use recycled plastic soda bottles if you wanted to bottle it that way and you'd want to squeeze some of the air out before tightening the cap on those. So there you have it, nine bottles of tasty mead. That one with the purple cap I left unsweetened. Beautiful.
So we brewed these up as a session mead or a hydromel. Basically a low alcohol mead, more akin to like a wine cooler or a beer in style. The big benefit of brewing our tasty mead as a session mead is that we can drink it quick. It turns around real fast and we go from pitching yeast to bottling in as little as a month. This one took about four days to ferment. I cold crashed it in the fridge for two days and then I bottled. And so this was actually in the bottles in under a week. And then it spent another couple of weeks bottle conditioning so it could get that nice sparkle. If you added a ton more honey, that would turn this into a different style of mead. And it might be so alcoholic that your yeast couldn't bottle condition your bottles. So if you add more honey, say you double or triple the honey in here, you're also gonna double or triple the strength, alcohol by volume, of your finished mead. And in that case, you might wanna serve it still rather than sparkling. And you might want more fruit than what we added to this one. So let's open them up. The one with the red cap here has been sweetened. That's what you wanna hear. And this one with the purple cap, we left unsweetened. So let's start with the unsweetened one. The one I'm the most skeptical about. A lot of times you need a little bit of sweetness to balance out your fruit. But in the interest of science, let's see what this tastes like unsweetened. It's actually not bad. It, uh, it's, it's very tart. It's got a lot of that acidity that you would associate with raspberries, but it does have a lot of that floral, fruity flavor of the blueberry. And because there's not a lot of sweetness there, the tannin really does kind of take over. The tannin is that sensation of bitterness or astringency. It's delicate in here, but it's enough that not having the sweetness, you really notice it. And that comes from the fruit skins and the seeds. Still, it's really refreshing and quite nice. And now our sweetened version. That little bit of erythritol really helps the fruit flavors come out. You don't notice the tannin as much, and the blueberry that's in there is kind of hoisted up by that sweetness and kind of thrown into the forefront. So across your tongue, as you drink the mead, you taste that sharpness and acidity and brightness of the raspberries. And then when you exhale, you get that sweetness and richness of the blueberries. It's actually really nice. Now, I know they probably didn't intend this to be an actual recipe that you would homebrew with, but I think it actually, this version works pretty well and it's pretty tasty. And I think it's probably very, very accessible for a new homebrewer who's never homebrewed something before. But that said, as somebody who's homebrewed quite a bit, and I think I'm gonna finish both of these jars tonight. If you wanna learn more about homebrewing, just subscribe to our channel. It's that easy. We post a ton of homebrewing content here on YouTube. We also have an Instagram at doing the most okay. We've got a website, doingthemost.org, and we're on Twitch at doing the most okay. We're not gaming over there though, we're homebrewing. And of course, we've got a Discord server at discord.doingthemost.org. Would you like to see other video game meads on the channel? Drop a comment and let me know what video game mead you'd like to see brewed here. Until next time, happy brewing, happy gaming, good luck, have fun, and cheers.